Aaron has just become a detective and already got his first real case. He has to work undercover at a luxurious resort. The police suspect that the hotel owners are involved in some shady deals. Aaron's first task is to sneak into the manager's office and check his documents. But the door is locked, and there's a combination lock. Aaron has to figure out the password. The young detective knows he needs to solve a math riddle, and the answer will be the code. 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 1 plus 1 times 0 plus 1 equals. As soon as he punches in the code, the door opens. What is the correct number? It's 30. There are no mathematical symbols at the end of the first and second lines. It means the whole thing looks like this. 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 1 plus 1 times 0 plus 1 equals 30. Aaron manages to get into the office and look through the papers, but he doesn't find anything useful there. While the detective was busy, one guest discovered her diamond ring and earrings were missing. Someone must have stolen the jewelry. Aaron has three suspects, Walter, another guest, Alice, a maid, and Alan, a porter. The undercover detective decides to check their rooms. He can't spend much time there, but what he sees is enough for him to understand who the thief is. Can you figure it out? It's Alice. There's already a packed suitcase in her room. She's about to run away with the stolen jewelry. Another day, another problem. This time, someone pushed elderly Mrs. Stevenson into the swimming pool when there was no one around. But this someone didn't know the lady was once the best swimmer of her university, and she never stopped practicing. And it wasn't difficult for her to cross the swimming pool and get out of it at the other side. Aaron asked the lady if she had seen the attacker. She didn't. But she was sure it was someone who knew she'd just received a huge inheritance. The detective needed to talk to three people. There were Mrs. Stevenson's son, Terry, her granddaughter, Gloria, and her niece, Judy. Terry said, These days I've been very busy. Something urgent came up at work. I don't even have time to leave my room to go to breakfast or dinner. Gloria asked Aaron to keep her secret. She was seeing a waiter she'd met at a beach cafe. If her relatives found out, they would be furious. And Judy told Aaron she'd taken a car to go shopping to the city center. Who is lying? Terry, the man looks sunburned. How can it be if he hasn't left his room for days? Aaron suspected one guest was involved in the newest criminal scheme of the hotel owners. He started to follow the man, watching his every step. At night, the detective would climb the tree growing next to the man's room and check if he was doing something fishy. One night, he saw the man tossing and turning in his bed for hours. He must be up to no good, Aaron thought. As if on cue, the man picked up the receiver, dialed some number, waited for a while, and hung up without saying a word. Soon after that, he fell asleep. What was the whole thing about? Someone was snoring loudly in the room next to his, but the phone ringing woke up the person who was snoring, and the man finally managed to fall asleep. Finally, our undercover detective seems to be on the right track. A rich businessman, Mr. Wilson, disappeared from his room. It was rumored he'd come to buy the resort from the current owners. The police questioned four suspects and shared this information with Aaron. The businessman's assistant said, I felt unwell on our way here. I went to my room and as soon as we arrived, took some medicine and fell asleep immediately. The hotel owner said, We agreed to meet with Mr. Wilson in a conference room, but I got lost while trying to find him. I finally came there, but Mr. Wilson never showed up. Mr. Wilson's wife, who accompanied him on his trip, said, My husband was going to meet with the hotel owner. I'm not interested in business, so I went to the spa. Who is behind the businessman's disappearance? The hotel owner. How could he get lost in his own hotel?
Ethan put a coin into an empty bottle and plugged it tightly with a cork. Then he told his friend he'd remove the coin without breaking the bottle or taking out the cork. And he did it. How? Ethan pushed the cork into the bottle and shook it to make the coin fall out. Jack was about to fail his exam. Luckily, the professor gave him one last chance. The guy had to arrange four nines to make them equal 100. He could use any math symbols. How did he do it? Jack figured out the correct answer pretty fast. 99 plus 9 out of 9 equals 100. Christina was dreaming of dating a rich boy from her college. After doing some research, she settled on three guys. All of them were nice and interested in her. But the girl needed the richest. Once she saw them having lunch together, after checking what each of them was eating, Christina made her choice. Which guy did she pick? The guy who's eating seafood and avocado. Not only are these products the most expensive, but they're also the healthiest. When do you look at number 2 and say 10? It happens when you look at your wristwatch. You're given 8 eggs. You need to break 2, cook 2, and eat 2. How many eggs will you have in the end? You can break, cook, and eat two eggs. It'll leave you with six eggs. Julia was angry with her boyfriend. She sent a message to her best friend who lived in Switzerland. In this message, the girl complained about something the guy had done, but her friend sent her a very strange reply. Give, get, give, get, give, get, give, get. What did Julia's friend mean? She wanted to say that Julia should forgive and forget. You're walking through the forest. Suddenly, you see a crossroad and a man standing there. One road leads to the village where criminals live and the other to a safe place. You don't know whether you could trust this person. You can ask him one question. If the man is a criminal, he'll lie. If he's from the safe place, he'll tell you the truth. Which question should you ask? Where is your village? If the person is innocent, he'll send you to the safe place. If he's a criminal, he'll lie and point to the safe place too. It was Mr. and Mrs. Anderson's wedding anniversary and everyone was getting ready for the party. Mrs. Anderson wanted to put on a diamond bracelet her husband gave her for their wedding. When she opened her jewelry box, she didn't see the bracelet. Trying not to panic, the woman called her teenage daughters, Joan and Andrea. I've told you a thousand times not to touch my things, and still, one of you has taken my jewelry again. Joan shouted, I haven't touched your jewelry box. Andrea also denied taking her mom's stuff. Why would I need your bracelet? I've got lots of my own. Which girl is lying? It was Andrea who took the earrings. Mrs. Anderson didn't specify which piece of jewelry was missing. Then how did the girl know it was a bracelet? Can you figure out the answer to this rebus riddle? Mary plus Mary. The answer is summary. One out of nine identical balls is heavier than the others. How can you figure out which one it is after only two weighings? You should divide all the balls into three groups and weigh two of them. That's how you can figure out which group contains the heavy ball. After that, you should pick two balls from the heaviest group, weigh one of them with the other, 
and you'll understand which ball of the three is the heaviest. So Charles found himself locked in a small room. He didn't know what had happened. Just then, he saw a door. He approached it and tried to open it, but it was locked. There were three buttons. On one button, there was a circle. On the second one, a triangle. On the third, a square. Charles didn't know which one would unlock the door. Luckily, though, there was a note. It said 12, 4, 8. Which button should he press to get out? You might have noticed that there's a clock right above the door. It's there for a reason. If you draw lines connecting 12, 4, and 8, you get a triangle. So Charles should press the button with the triangle on it. Esme was having a regular walk in the forest and got lost. She wandered around all night in the dark. Just after sunrise, she came upon a witch's house. She had nowhere else to go, so she walked in and asked the witch to send her home. The witch agreed, but it wasn't going to be that easy. Three magical doors appeared, and Esme had to decide which one to go through. Behind the first door, nothing but a deep pit. Behind the second door was a shower of toxic liquid. Behind the third door was an open space, with a vampire waiting for her. Which way should Esme go? Well, it's already past sunrise. The vampire would be gone already, hiding out somewhere dark. Esme should pick the third door. Maybe Esme could have just jumped over the pit. What do you think? Take a look at these pictures. Which blogger is richer? The second one. Look at the number of likes. She has 17,000, but the first one only has 7,000. One of Mr. Smith's sons, Jaden, was taken. Several hours later, Mr. Smith and his younger son, David, received a letter. The letter stated that if they wanted to see Jaden again, they should round up a million dollars cash and take it to a little shack in the woods. Mr. Smith and David decided to do it, and David took the money into the woods alone. But it didn't go as planned. David said that halfway to the shack, someone approached him from behind, hit him, and stole the money. There was an investigation, and a detective asked David what the robber looked like. David said that he had dark hair and a red hoodie with a black logo on it. The detective immediately figured out who had taken Jaden. Can you? It was David. He said the robber approached him from behind. But somehow, he still managed to remember some pretty specific details about the robber. Nah, he made it all up. Abigail wanted to buy her mom the best birthday present ever. The problem was, she had zero ideas. She decided to sneak into her mom's computer, go to her online shopping cart, and see what she had saved in there. When her mom left for work, Abigail sneaked into her home office and turned on the computer. Uh Uh-oh, it required a password, and Abigail didn't know it. There was a sticky note attached to the keyboard. It was a clue. One apple, two apple, two orange, two kiwi, one lemon. Can you guess the password? Each number represents one letter of the word. A apple means the first letter, so A. Then we get P, R, I, and L. The password is April. Wow, her mom is really into fruit. A lady was shopping and left the store right after paying. A couple of minutes later, she returned. She had forgotten her wallet at the checkout counter. But the wallet was already gone. She called the police and reported the robbery. A detective interrogated the people who were in the store at the time. Sophia, the cashier, said she didn't see the wallet after the lady paid. Robert, a pilot who happened to be shopping there, said he didn't even see the wallet. He didn't have his glasses on. Mark, a landscaper, said he was in a different part of the store, so he didn't see anything. So, who stole the wallet? It was Robert, the pilot. 
he looks pretty blind without his glasses, so he's definitely not a pilot. Why would he lie about that? Unless… Amelia's brother, Neil, was a crazy scientist. In the past year, he had been working on a time machine. One day, he ran into Amelia's room and screamed. He'd done it! He'd invented a time machine and it totally worked! He said he had already tested it. He managed to talk to William Shakespeare, Princess Diana, and Sherlock Holmes. Amelia didn't believe him at all. Why was she so sure about it? Even if Neil had actually invented a time machine, he'd only have been able to talk to people who actually existed in real life. He said he talked to Sherlock Holmes. That guy's a character from a book and a TV show and a movie. Hey, that guy's everywhere. A woman called the police and reported that she had been robbed. She said she was in a restaurant bathroom fixing her makeup. Someone had come up from behind and hit her on the head, so she didn't know what the person looked like. The police sent her home and refused to fill out the report. Why? The woman was fixing her makeup, so she must have been looking in the mirror. She would have definitely seen someone sneaking up behind her. She lied and made up the whole story. Grab your detective hat and head over to Europe for this next one. Bill was traveling from Paris to Berlin by train. When the train got to Berlin, Bill wasn't on it. His friend reported him missing. The investigation began, and somewhere between Paris and Berlin, they found some interesting clues. There were footsteps that belonged to Bill, and a few feet away, his luggage. A detective found the person who had been sitting next to Bill on the train. His name was Sam. He said that Bill didn't have a ticket. When he saw the ticket inspector coming, he decided to make a run for it. He threw his suitcase off the train and then jumped. The detective didn't believe his story and arrested Sam for pushing Bill off the train. Why? Look at the direction the train was going. If Sam's story was true, the suitcase should be behind Bill's footsteps, not in front. Sam pushed Bill off the train, then threw his luggage off after. Mrs. Anderson came home from work in the middle of the day because she'd forgotten some important documents. When she went to the bedroom, she saw her husband lying on the bed. There was a paramedic beside him. Mr. Anderson was unconscious, and the doctor explained that he had been poisoned. Luckily, he had had time to call a paramedic before passing out. Mrs. Anderson immediately blocked off the door and called the police. She said there was a fake paramedic in her house who had poisoned her husband. How did she know? You might have noticed that when Mrs. Anderson arrived, there was no ambulance in the driveway. That's super suspicious. William was hit on the head and taken away. When he woke up, he found himself locked in a small room. He tried to open the door, but obviously it was locked. There was nothing in the room except for a wooden box with 12 bottles in it. There was an extra bottle on the floor next to it. William looked everywhere for the key, but found nothing. After a bit of thinking, he noticed something. He managed to find the key. Where was it? Look at the bottle on the floor. It's exactly the same as the others, but for some reason, it's a bit lower. There must be a fake floor in the box. That's where the key is. Several women went missing in a small city. The police searched for months, but they couldn't find any trace of them. One day, a detective got lucky. He saw a hooded figure who matched their description, followed it, and found the place where they were being kept hostage. But when he busted in, there were just three women. They all said that they had been locked in this small room, but the detective knew that one of them wasn't a victim at all. The first woman said her name was Emery. She had spent around a year in that room. The second woman, Aria, said she had been there about six months. The third woman said her name was Brielle and that she had been locked up in there for about two months. 
Can you tell who's lying? Emery's lying. Look at her hair. She just had it dyed, but she's been there a year. Aria's hair is also dyed, but you can see her natural dark roots growing out. After years in college, Stephen came back to his hometown. He met up with a couple of his old friends, Dylan and Harry. Both of them said they're successful bloggers now. To prove it, they showed him screenshots from their most popular videos. Steve took a look at them and could tell that one of his friends was lying. Who's lying and how did Steve know? Harry's lying. The number of views for his video is 2.1 million, but the number of likes is way higher, 4.5 million. That's impossible, or at least really, really suspicious. Harry probably photoshopped that screenshot. Uh Uh-huh. Two teen sisters, Maya and Ariana, were supposed to study in the library, but one of them went to a party instead. When they came back home, their parents could immediately tell who hadn't been to the library. Can you? It was Maya. Look, there's glitter in her hair. Mr. Harris is a landlord. In his building, it's prohibited to have any pets, but he keeps hearing some barking on the third floor. There are three apartments there, so he decides to pay a visit to everyone who lives on that floor. Mr. Walker, Ms. Clark, and Mr. Allen. Can you tell who keeps a dog? It's Mr. Allen. Take a look at the shoe rack. Some of his shoes are chewed. Four friends were going to another city by car. But at some point, something distracted the driver, and they got in a car crash. A police officer arrived and started the investigation. He asked who had been driving, but no one took the blame. Then, the officer inspected the car. Can you tell who the driver was? The driver was the red-haired girl. There's a sweater on the driver's seat. She's the only one not wearing a jacket or sweater, so it must be hers. Mrs. Miller was waiting for a delivery, but she never got it. And since the woman had to go to work, she asked her husband to drive to the post office and ask about her package. When Mrs. Miller came back home, Mr. Miller said he'd just returned from the post office, but they said the package hadn't arrived yet. Mrs. Miller didn't believe him and claimed he hadn't driven anywhere. How did she understand it? Take a look at the car. It's all covered in snow. To go to the post office, Mr. Miller would have to clean it first. In a parallel universe, you're only allowed to have fun and eat candy. No one ever reads or studies. Mrs. Rellum came back home after a long and entertaining day at the club. Her three daughters were supposed to have a lot of fun on their own. She asked them what they had been doing. Hannah said she'd been watching TV all day long. Ellie answered she'd spent the day at a water park. Ava told her mom she and her friends had a candy-eating contest. Still, Mrs. Rellum could tell one of her daughters was lying. That daughter spent all day studying. Who was it? It was Hannah. Take a closer look at her hands. There are some ink stains. If she had actually watched TV, she wouldn't have needed a pen. In June, students of the Faculty of Economics had their econometrics exam. It was the hardest one in that semester, and everyone was worried. On the day of the exam, the students entered the classroom. Everyone was assigned to a specific seat. A professor was sure one of the students was going to cheat, So he made that person sit right in front of him. Which student was it? And how did the professor know? It's the guy with dark hair. It's June, and all the students are lightly dressed. Still, this student is wearing a sweater with long sleeves. He must be up to something. Now, take a look at these three students. Savannah, Melody, and Scarlett. 
One of them managed to cheat at the exam, and no one noticed it. Can you tell who it was and how she managed to use her notes? It was Scarlett. She's wearing long boots. That's where she kept her notes. Michelle was having a house party. She noticed that her brother had disappeared and went upstairs to find him. When she neared his room, she heard laughter. Her brother was in there with some girl. But Michelle couldn't figure out who it was. She got very curious. So after they left, she sneaked into his room to look for some hints. She suspected three girls, Lily, Sydney, and Nicole. Michelle immediately guessed who her brother was dating. Who was it? Her brother is dating Nicole. There's an earring on the couch. And Nicole is wearing only one earring, which looks exactly the same. She must have lost it. Can you tell which student in the classroom isn't a real person? The guy in the middle doesn't cast a shadow. There's definitely something fishy about him. Michael had a crush on Ellie, the girl he studied with. One day, he decided to write her a note, asking her out. Unfortunately, he didn't remember which desk was Ellie's. Can you tell which one Michael needs? Take a look at Ellie's photo. She's waving her left hand, which means she's likely left-handed. There's only one desk where the pen is to the left of the copybook. It must be Ellie's desk. A grocery store manager found out that someone had been stealing bananas from the store all the time. The man conducted his own investigation and got three suspects. But he couldn't accuse the customers until he was 100% sure. Take a look at these people and say who the banana thief is. Look at the guy wearing a top hat. It's a perfect place for hiding and stealing stuff. He must be the thief. Brandon and Genevieve are on their working trip to London. They decided to meet in a cafe in the evening. Now, they're both driving there. Can you tell which of them isn't smart? Brandon. In England, people drive on the left side of the road and he's driving on the right. Early in the morning, a big sum of money went missing from the accountant's safe in the office. Only three people were at work at that time. Haley, the accountant, said she'd left for a couple of minutes to go to the bathroom. Eric, the software manager, claimed he'd had his lunch break and hadn't seen anything. Joseph, the cleaning man, said he'd been cleaning the second floor at the time. Can you figure out who's lying? It's Eric. He couldn't have a lunch break. It was still early in the morning. Someone had been stealing food from a grocery store. The manager couldn't find out who it was and hired a detective. Look at the security camera footage for the last year and say who the thief is. It's the dark-haired pregnant lady. It's been a year and she's still pregnant. Plus, the size of her belly has never changed. It must be fake. Theo was spending the day with her boyfriend, Derek. After lunch, he said he had some urgent business to deal with and left her for a couple of hours. When Derek came back, Theo realized he'd been cheating on her and broke up with him. How did she find out? Take a closer look at Derek's neck. There's a lipstick stain. It's red, while Theo is wearing pink lipstick, which means it's not hers. Mr. Roberts, one of the best surgeons in the country, came to his insurance company. The man said he'd been robbed right in the street. The assistant asked if Mr. Roberts remembered any specific details about the criminal. He said he didn't. Everything happened too fast, and he had very bad eyesight. The assistant refused to start the investigation, 
He said Mr. Roberts was lying. He wasn't actually robbed. Why didn't the man believe Mr. Roberts? Mr. Roberts is a surgeon. But it's not possible to work as one if you have poor eyesight. It means Mr. Roberts lied. In a small town, someone stole all the chicken nuggets from a local store. The owner called the police, and they started the investigation. There were three suspects who were in the store at around that time. Mrs. Wilson said her family was vegetarian. She wouldn't be interested in chicken nuggets. Mr. Martin said he'd needed to return home very fast. He had to take a conference call. He didn't have any time to waste. Mr. Thomas simply stated that he hadn't stolen anything. Can you tell who the thief is? The thief is Mrs. Wilson. She said her family was vegetarian, but behind her back, there's a freshly cooked chicken on the table. Esme was having a walk in the forest. After it started to get dark, the girl tried to find her way back home, but got lost. Finally, she came across a witch's house and asked the woman to help her find her way home. The witch only agreed to do so on one condition. She gave Esme a piece of string and said, Put it anywhere. If I can step over it, I'll keep you with me forever. If I don't manage to do it, I'll show you the way home. What can Esme do? Esme should put the string right next to the wall. This way, the witch won't be able to step over it. Take a close look at the picture and figure out who the thief is. Look at this guy. His right hand is inside the woman's bag. A super wealthy businessman, Mr. Carl Jenkins, has been taken and left locked up all alone in a dark room. His phone's almost run out of charge, so he can only write one message. He knows that someone might spy on his phone, so he decided to write a message with a code to a high school friend, John Smith, who runs a detective agency. He remembered that in high school, they would cipher messages to each other, so he used the same technique. The message was this. Can you guess what it means? Back in high school, they would shift one letter to the right each time they needed to write a secret code. To decipher it, you need to go one letter to the left. Their alphabet looks like this. The message is, it was Eric. Having read the message, John knew immediately who his friend was talking about. Eric is the financial director of Carl's company. He had seen him once at a party a couple of years ago, so he knew what he looked like. John decided to investigate this case himself and help his friend out. He was sure there was something secret in Carl's mansion. Somehow, he thought he knew that Eric would have the key to the mansion. The receptionist, Kelly, said he would always have lunch with different business partners at 2 p.m. sharp in his favorite cafe. When the detective drove up to the cafe, he saw Eric, the man with a beard, discussing business with someone. Either of them had a briefcase next to them, and the briefcases looked similar to each other. John was waiting for Eric and the second guy to leave the cafe. They went to the car, got in, and left both briefcases on the back seat. The detective followed them. They left the car in a parking lot, and luckily, they were careless enough to leave the car open. Which briefcase should the detective grab? The one that looks brand new. While they were walking to the car, the detective spotted a few scratches on the second man's briefcase. Both briefcases were locked with a cipher. Not to make the whole thing suspicious, the detective decided not to take it and cracked the code right in the car. Can you help him open the briefcase?
The code is 000. The briefcase is brand new, and Eric probably didn't have time to set a code on it yet. Plus, Eric's the one who leaves the car open and unattended in a parking lot. So, no wonder he uses a default code for his briefcase. Now that the detective has the key, he heads to the mansion. The front door isn't a problem with the key in hand. The study is upstairs. He's been there before, so he remembers the stairs leading up have a secret. If you step on the wrong stair, you'll instantly fall to the basement and won't be able to escape from it yourself. What step should John mind? It's the one with the slit in the middle. When you step on it, it opens, and you get into a dark room with bats and spiders. Yikes! Alright, John is finally at the study door, and Carl would always use buttons to open it. You've got only one try. There are three buttons, yellow, green, and blue. Which one should the detective choose if he knows that Carl is a big fan of painting? A combination of blue and yellow gives green, so the door opens. Green light for our detective. He finally reaches the safe with top-secret documents that could help him find out the truth. Obviously, just like any other safe, it's locked with a code. It also has a warning. You can enter the code only once. If you hit the wrong code, the safe locks up forever. He's looking around for a hint, and voila, John is right. On the desk, he sees a note. It says, secret code, and has a combination of three digits. Three, something, and one. The digit in the middle can't be seen since there's an ink stain right on it. Can you crack the code with one attempt only? The code is 371. The detective thought the code was used frequently, so the button must have been a bit worn out. He was right. Since he knew the beginning and the end, he only needed to find one more worn button. Alright, now he's got the top secret documents he needed for his investigation. He looks through all the papers and finally finds something that looks like the document he actually needed. To take it as a hard proof, he needs to find one which is not fake. There are four copies. They look almost the same, but only one is real. Can you guess which one? It's the one in the upper left corner. It has a stamp, a signature, and it says agreement. The one next to it looks the same, but it has a spelling mistake. It says agreement. Other copies lack either a stamp or a signature. So the detective takes a closer look at this agreement and sees something about a painting bought in an auction. He suddenly understands that his friend Carl was taken so that someone could sneak into his mansion and grab that super expensive painting. He's looking at the wall with all the paintings Carl collected and realizes that no painting is missing. There are as many nails in the wall as there are paintings. Still. There's something strange about one of them. Can you spot what's wrong here? Even though all the paintings are present, there's one that lacks a frame. According to the agreement, the painting has been recently bought, and an art dealer helped Carl pick it. The expert was an honest man, and he helped Carl make sure all the other paintings in his collection were real. This time, the painting turned out to be nothing but a copy. Why did the expert suggest that Carl buy it? Although the painting cost nothing, its frame was a beautiful and expensive piece of art. The one who grabbed it definitely knew that. Now it's all clear. John has to find both Carl and the precious frame. He goes outside, trying to deduce where the person who took Carl went. 
Carl is looking at all the tracks on the ground. He needs to follow one of them to understand where to look for Carl. Where should he go? He's got to follow the tracks going to the left. There are three sets of tracks here. The first belong to John's car. The second set belongs to a two-wheel vehicle, and since the tracks are really thin, they were left by a bike. It seems impossible to take someone somewhere on a bike, so these must belong to a mail carrier who comes every day to bring the letters. The last set of tracks definitely belongs to a large car, so John should follow it. He's lucky and there are no turns, so he's just going straight. Half an hour later, he sees something like a castle. He drives up to it and he sees three moats in front of him. Here's the first one, a row full of metal stakes. How can John jump over it safely? There's a small hot air balloon nearby. John has to untie it and light the lamp to take off. Since the next moat is on fire, John thinks it's unsafe to fly over it because the air balloon doesn't fly high enough and the lamp doesn't have enough oil to go on for long. Still, he managed to cross the moat with fire easily. How did he do it? He took the sand from the air balloon's ballast and sprinkled it on the fire, extinguishing it. The last moat was filled with scalding hot lava. It took John some time to figure out how to cross it, but he managed to do it safely. How? There were a lot of stones around him. The lava torrent wasn't deep at all, so throwing stones at it, he made a tiny path to hop on. The castle was rather small inside, so the hardest thing was to actually get into it. When he entered the hall, John saw three doors. Above the doors, there was a sign. It said, One of the doors leads to a labyrinth no one ever escaped. One of the doors is the exit. If you enter it, you'll have to cross all the three moats all over again. One of the doors has what you're looking for. When John looked at the doors, he knew immediately where his friend was. Which door did he choose? The handles were made of shiny metal, which looks cool but gathers all the fingerprints. The only door with fingerprints is the one on the left. John opens the door and sees his friend. Carl rushes out of that dark room, and while heading to the exit, they spot a few frames. Which one is Carl's? The rectangular one. The painting was rectangular, and the two other frames are square. The two friends get out of the castle, get in the car, and head to the police department. There, an officer's waiting for them. They have three suspects who could have possibly taken the exquisite frame. Carl and John enter the room separately. Still, they choose the same person. Who did they choose? The man on the right. Carl chooses him because it's the art expert. John chooses him because he saw him with Carl having lunch. Wow, seems like this expert's not going to work with Carl ever again. Ellis had to go to the hospital the other day. When she entered, she immediately felt something off about the place. Walking along the hall, she spotted three doctors. There was something completely wrong about one of them. Which doctor is crazy? The one on the left, he's got wolf eyes and teeth, and there's no badge on his uniform. Stay away from him, Ellis. Alright, Ellis didn't listen to our piece of advice and went straight to Dr. Wolf's room. 
He says he needs to apply some new protective cream on her. But in fact, he just wants to test it. After covering Ellis with this magic lotion, she shouldn't have trusted him. He makes Ellis choose one of three containers to jump into. Wow, this is a weird hospital. One of them is filled with toxic waste. In the second container, there's acid that can eat through metal. The third one is filled with lava from a volcano that almost ruined a whole town a year ago. What container should Ellis choose? At least this time, Ellis made the right choice. She picked the container with lava. The volcano erupted a year ago, so the lava is already completely solid and cool. Okay, she nailed the first experiment, and Dr. Wolf gives Ellis a choice of three pills. He says the red one can help see the past, the blue one can help see the future, and the yellow one can help read other people's minds. Which one should Ellis choose? Ellis was smart enough this time. She randomly picked the yellow one, but she suspected it was another experiment. She gulped the water but never swallowed the pillow and still has it in her cheek. In fact, all three of them were poisoned. When the wolf went outside for a second, Ellis spat out the pill and ran away. Hey, try the urgent care clinic, Ellis. No wolf's there. Ginny was cooking dinner for her friends. When everyone was at the table, she suddenly realized there was something wrong with one of her friends. Which friend didn't like the meal? It's Mike. He secretly shared it with Jenny's dog. Everybody knows that an old witch lives in this spooky old house. Nobody really wants to meet her. Mary is in this house right now, but she seems to be alone. How come? Who said witches can't have a name Mary? She was once young and beautiful too, but then that darn spell happened. One town had a weird law that said all the men had to be cleanly shaven, but no man was allowed to shave himself. The only person who was licensed to shave them was a 40-year-old hairdresser. But who shaved the hairdresser? Yeah, there was no need. The hairdresser was a woman. Allison met a stranger yesterday, and she immediately knew who he was. She hadn't seen this person before, and no one had ever described him to her. He wasn't a celebrity, and he wasn't doing anything unusual. So how come she knew who he was? The man was the twin brother of one of Allison's friends. Bill is a shoe shiner. He offers his services to passers-by for free. Still, people who accept it end up paying him of their own will. How so? Bill shines only one shoe for free. People don't want to look bizarre with just one clean shoe and have to pay for the shining of the other one. The king told his three daughters to place three identical kettles with the same amount of water on the fire. The king promised that the husband of the daughter, whose kettle would boil first, would become his heir. His youngest daughter's kettle boiled first. How come? While the other daughters kept lifting their kettle's lids to check if the water was already boiling, The youngest one kept it closed. Up for some math? Nah, just kidding. You'll only need your logic. Find a way to get 200 out of 188 by just using one line. Use the line to cut 188 horizontally. This way, you'll get two 100s. One person was 25 years old in 2000 and 20 years old in 2005. How is this possible? This person lived before Common Era. 
One man went to his friend's party and told his wife he'd be back before sunrise. He shaved and left home. He returned as promised before sunrise, but he was sporting a long, thick beard. How come? The man and his wife lived in a place with polar nights that can last for several months. A man was driving his car all the way from New York to Boston. Only at the end of the trip did he discover that one of his car's tires had been punctured from the very beginning. Still, he managed to reach his destination successfully, and his journey wasn't affected by this problem at all. How is it possible? The punctured tire was the spare one. The financial director of a big company finally persuaded new partners to sign a super important agreement. He then put this document into a folder and left it on the table in his office. When he arrived at work the next morning, the folder was gone. John gathered all the employees who were in the office at the time and questioned them. The cleaning lady said that she had been busy washing the floor and hadn't paid attention to anything around. The designer explained that he hadn't left his working place even once. What's more, being an artist, he didn't have any interest in agreement documents. The accountant admitted that he had entered John's office to have some documents signed. But once he noticed there was no one inside, he immediately left. Who took the folder with the agreement? It was the designer. John never mentioned which folder was gone. How would he know that the missing folder had an agreement inside? Eric wears either only black or only white socks. One morning, he was in a hurry, getting ready for an important meeting with new partners. Suddenly, the power goes out. The guy has 10 white and 10 black socks in his drawer, but all of them are mixed. He doesn't want to look silly at work wearing different socks. If it's completely dark in the room and Eric can't see anything, how many socks should he pull out of the drawer to get himself two matching ones? Three socks are more than enough. In a set of three socks, he's bound to have two of the same color. A hungry vampire is following you in a lonely street one dark night. Suddenly, you see a house with its door wide open and decide to hide there. The vampire can't enter your shelter since you lock the door in the nick of time, but it's waiting for you outside. However, you still have some hope. There are three doors leading out of the house. When you open the first door, there's molten lava. No thanks. The second door leads to the room with tarantulas as large as your head. Yikes! As for the third door, you can definitely hear a huge dog barking inside that room, and you're kind of afraid of it. What should you do? Ah, just wait till morning. Vampires can't stand daylight, and your pursuer will have to leave you alone. You're trapped in a room that's slowly getting filled with water coming from a faucet on the wall. There are no windows in the room, and the door is sealed shut. You have a mop and a big bucket. So how are you going to get yourself out of this one? Come on, just turn the faucet off. Now it's better. Jane told her boss someone had taken the document she prepared for the meeting. She added that she had noticed someone come in wearing a smart suit, gloves, and a black mask, safety first. This person also had three rings on their fingers. The boss didn't believe her. Why? She said the person was wearing gloves. Then how did she see three rings on their fingers? Jane must have simply forgotten to print those documents out. A hotel owner was visiting the construction site to see the progress. He wanted to start welcoming the guests as soon as possible and had big plans. At some point, he left his briefcase with important documents on the table. Some worker grabbed it and ran away. The hotel owner didn't see who it was, but he immediately called the police. There were three suspects. 
The architect said he had been talking on the phone, trying to get electricity for the site as there was not. The designer told the police he had been trying to find the best paint for the walls. The electrician explained he had been down in the basement trying to fix a burst light bulb. The detectives figure out who was lying. Can you? It was the electrician. How could he fix the burst light bulb if there was no electricity at the construction site at all? Ah, liar, liar, pants on fire!